Cheerio, blokes. It's the VC Andrews Critica. Yeah, I've always been quite the fan of British media, from Mawson Gromit to Paddington Bear to Roald Dahl works to Bedazzled to The Worst Witch, and of course Harry Potter like everyone freaking else. But I'd say the current icon of British children's media is a blue-haired, sharp, if somewhat feisty girl who goes on bizarre adventures in surreal fantasy worlds. Uh, I said this one was British. Well, yeah, I guess the original novel of Coraline was set in Britain as well, but point still remains, I'm actually talking about Hilda. It's the story of Hilda, last name unknown, a girl who lives with her mother in a Gravity Falls-like forest, and art style for that matter, filled with all sorts of Adventure Time-like creatures, including her pet Deer Fox Twig. They may not have any other humans for miles, but they're happy with their supernatural wilderness life of solitude. That is until an unknown source starts sending them messages saying they need to get the hell out of there and start harassing them. With some investigation, Hilda finds the source is a tiny village of elves, who can only be seen by signing paperwork with them, who want them out of the picture because... Well, they're giants and are unknowingly inflicting danger on them just by walking outside. Hilda has no intention of leaving her wilderness home at first, but once her own house is destroyed by a giant compared to them, she realizes how the creatures must feel, so she and her mom move to a nearby city called Trollberg, with one of the elves named Alfred joining them to do a study on human city life. Needless to say, Hilda has about as much clue about city life as Netflix does about when Stranger Things Season 4 will finally come out, but does have the help of her two new best friends named David and Frida, but Hilda soon finds that Trollberg has almost as many supernatural entities as the forest she used to live in. Some nice, but most... not so much. What's more, there's a new type of adversity that she never encountered in the forest. Strained relationships, not just with David and Frida, but also with her own mother eventually. But what does Hilda do? I try to make it of the time. <laughs> I had heard about the show when it first came out, but it initially never really caught my interest. That is, until I heard Bella Ramsey was the voice of Hilda while doing my old versus new of The Worst Witch. And yeah, I know I didn't give the Mildred Hubble point to her in that comparison, but I still freaking loved her in that show. And after hearing the rave reviews for it, I finally gave it a shot. And yeah, it is really freaking good. The animation is gorgeously vibrant and colorful with really smooth character movements, almost at Disney level at times, and while the designs of the humans are somewhat simplistic, not bad by any means, just not the most memorable in the animation, the designs of the Adventure Time-like creatures you will never forget if you live to be a hundred. But more importantly, the show is written by really intelligent people who did a phenomenal job at mixing surreal fantasy with our natural everyday life, making the show exciting but also relatable, and gave us some great characters to execute it, like the timid but lovable David and Alfred, the smart-ass but nonetheless smart Frida and Woodman, the somewhat stern but still very loving and supportive Joanna and that blonde officer, or whatever her name is, and of course the somewhat stubborn and feisty but still brave, smart, and generally kind-hearted Hilda herself. But of course we got asked which episodes of this masterpiece are the cream of the crop, which had the best humor, the best drama, the best animation, and most importantly, the best writing. Now again, this is all opinion based and you may not agree with the episodes that I choose, but since it's my show, it's my call. These are the top 10 episodes of Hilda. Number 10 The Replacements this was the second to last season 2 episode before the classic Stone Forest finale, so was it a worthy predecessor to that, Jim? Let's take a look. The episode starts with Alfred's usual jolly morning interrupted by a new elf claiming to be his replacement as the Trollbird correspondent to the Elf Village. See, the Elf Council's BS meters have been set off by Alfred's reports the me adventures he's had with Hilda, though that itself may seem a bit far-fetched given the world they live in. But nonetheless, Alfred's gotta go back to the elf village, but he and Hilda won't hear of that. So after an attempt to pass off one of the elves in a neighboring elf tribe as Alfred goes awry, they decide to bolt. That is until the council gets captured by Officer Gerda, yeah so that's where her name was apparently, who thinks they're ghosts and she can't see them and decides to do some experiments with them. That might have less than optimal results for the elves. Can Alfred and Hilda save them in time? Or will they even? 
Oh, who am I kidding? Of course they will. So yeah, I'm not gonna lie, this episode's execution is not quite as phenomenal as other episodes. I mean, it's by no means bad, it's just not quite as sharp or funny as the usual standards for this show, but it didn't earn a spot on this list for nothing. Just the concept alone of Alfred having to leave Hilda and Trollberg is a pretty emotional one, seeing how thick as thieves the two of them are. Maybe not to the level she is with David and Frida, but there is a connection these two share that we the viewers would really hate to see severed. Another neat thing about this episode is, this is so far the only episode where Alpha is the main focus, Usually Alfred's just a sidekick who infuses comic relief in the dark scenarios, but if anything, Hilda's actually Alfred's sidekick in this episode at best. Yeah, there's surprisingly not a whole lot that Hilda does in this episode, but that's fine since the story isn't a whole lot about her. But can Alfred carry an episode largely on his own? Well, at his best, he sure can, and thankfully, he's at his best here. He's noticeably more chill here and less afraid to violate protocol and take risks. What if we find a way to trick the delegation into going back home without you? I believe your people have a saying, desperate times call for desperate measures. I'm going to take that as a yes. I thought that was obvious. Surrender your passport at once, sir. <sighs> of course. What? But you'll have to catch me first. This makes him noticeably more entertaining while also showcasing the bond with Hilda that he doesn't want broken. And again, the humor of this episode is pretty below Hilda's standards, but it's still decent. The scene in the climax where Alfred pretends to be a ghost trick Gerda into releasing the other elves to him is pretty amusing, as are the other scenes where the citizens of Trollberg think the elves are ghosts for that matter. The elf council member who's a fangirl of Alfred's work is also pretty funny, and it's pretty heartwarming to see that a-hole replacement serve as the eyewitness to vouch for Alfred's claim, even though Alfred didn't even save his life. Yeah, he was the only one besides Alfred who wasn't captured, so you'd think one of the other council members would show their gratitude for, well, saving their frickin' lives. Eh, that's bureaucracy for you, I guess. So yeah, this episode is no gem, but just the idea of Alfred getting his own spotlight episode is still pretty neat, and though not Hilda standards execution-wise, it still wasn't done half bad. Number 9. The House in the Woods a very well done, return to one's roots episode, so to speak. No pun intended. The events from the previous episode have gotten Hilda lost in the woods, the very woods she grew up in as a matter of fact. She runs into her acquaintance from their woodman who's just lost a game of poker, which he better in. You bet me in a game of elf poker. Take me away. I'm all yours. Not them. Him. But turns out he did so so she could steal back all his old stuff. Doesn't go so well. Anyway, the two are lost trying to find their way back and stumble across a cabin in the woods. It appears abandoned, but also the perfect place for them to stay for the night. It's well furnished, cozy, and grants their every desire. But it doesn't seem to want them to leave in the morning either. So this is a neat episode for a couple reasons. First, it's nice to return to the forest again for the majority of the episode. And of all the creatures Hilda had to run into in the woods, Woodman was a pretty lucky pick. Maybe not so much for her, but for us, big time. The reason being that Woodman is basically a G-rated Frank Gallagher from Shameless. He's dry, cynical, mooches off everyone around him, is happy to put others in danger for his own benefit, and whenever he seems to show genuine care for Hilda, it always turns out to be a PSYCH! Finally! I missed you. You made me breakfast! I did not. Oh. But like with Frank, it's done in such an entertaining manner you can't help but enjoy him. Nothing personal, Hilda. Or Fiona Gallagher, for that matter. But these a-holes are just way too funny. But second, this episode shows some major character growth from Hilda. Remember how Hilda had expressed in the early episodes that nothing could ever make her leave the forest? Well, now that happens to her literally with this house that has magically sealed her in. Be careful what you wish for, kiddo. But Hilda knows that the forest isn't truly her home anymore, even with this house that magically gives her whatever the hell she wants, because the ones she loves are no longer there. Really shows character development, doesn't it? How about the comedy? Well, Woodman isn't the only source of that here. This bit really cracked me up, for instance. If you're really worried, we could send your mum an email. 
email. Sorry, elf mail. It's a relay system of elf couriers. I also like how when we're seeing Hilda and Woodman's friends and family in pictures as they try to escape, Woodman's are literally just a tree and a leaf. Then it is really sweet to see these two bond throughout the episode, eventually to the point where Woodman calls Hilda a friend and assures her that the woods will always still be in her heart. I'd show a clip of that scene, but this round's run on a bit too long. So with great character development, a hilarious sadist, and great shoutouts to the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, this episode is definitely worth a look. Number 8 the Eternal Warriors. Like how for earlier, this was David's first true time to be the main focus of an episode, and they came up with a good scenario for such. Hilda, David, and Frieda are once again on a camping trip with their Sparrow Scout tribe, only this time they're being sent down the wilderness in groups to camp out on their own. Hilda sets a course to camp near the Screaming Stones, but the pansy David is scared as hell of the shortcut they plan to take. Feeling guilty about having to make his friends take a longer route just to please him, David aspires to try and nut up, and the process runs into a long-lost Viking tribe, currently battling another long-lost Viking tribe for a medallion who makes whoever touches it fearless. David naturally wants this, so he joins the tribe, they win the battle, and David encounters Hilda and Frida the next morning with testosterone levels off the walls, ready to get to the Screaming Stones, and more importantly, help his new Viking friends kick ass in battle. So as you might have guessed, what makes this episode so awesome is seeing the wimpy David turn into this Ash Williams-like warrior who would gladly strangle Lucifer if given the chance, and he's really entertaining to watch in this phase. All we have to do is quietly and calmly... Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's right! Run, you fuzzy cowards! According to the Sparrow Scout handbook, we could have fixed the safety tether and repelled... Hey! <gasps> Chill. Hell, they even gave him his own 80s pop song, and not a bad one at that. Don't let your love fly away, fly away, don't be afraid to seize the day. But the real shining point in this episode is that it has a message very similar to Inside Out, about how an emotion you think is pointless and burdensome can actually be far more valuable than you think, only instead of sadness, it's fear in this case. Yeah, because the tribe has no restraint or caution in the battle, they get their asses handed to them pretty badly. By the way, you really had to applaud that this episode had the gall to show arms getting chopped off, warriors impaled, and even David getting frickin' decapitated. No, it's not especially gory with the parts where blood should be being covered by this glowing substance left over from the glowing weapons, but still, seeing this in a kid's show is just bizarre. But you know what? That's what makes it so engaging. Plus, it leads to this hilarious bit. What's going on? <laughs> Try again. The face goes in the front. It's not that hard. By the way, if you're wondering who that swamp dude is, he's the reason the Vikings are still alive after all these years. Apparently they stole the medallion from him, so as payback, he decided to have them needlessly fight over it for all eternity. The team who has it always loses the battle, but the swamp monster resurrects them, and they steal back from the team who now has it via a bloodbath. That team gets resurrected, rinse, and repeat. And again, that's a genius way to showcase the pointlessness of desiring to be fearless. Being too fearful isn't good either, but having no fear at all just makes you an idiot. And this episode delivered that message brilliantly in both a dramatic and comedic manner, complete with an awesome pop song. Don't let your love fly away, fly away, don't be afraid to seize the day. Number 7 The Nightmare Spirits A G-rated but nonetheless effective homage to Nightmare on Elm Street, lately David's been having horrible nightmares which he attributes to all the crappier pants adventures he's lately had with Hilda. Feeling bad, Hilda decides the best way for David to conquer his fears is to face them, namely the Rat King. No, not that Rat King. Thank heavens. There we go. It doesn't quite work, but they do learn that the cause of David's nightmares is from a cult of supernatural teenage girls called Mara who induce nightmares in people. They try to catch the one haunting David a few times unsuccessfully, but eventually succeed and she strikes a bargain. 
She'll back off David if Hilda allows her to haunt her dreams that night. Shouldn't be much of a problem since Hilda's harder to scare than the Warner siblings. But like we saw in the last episode, every sensible person is scared of something and Hilda is no exception. So yeah, what makes this episode so great is, like said before, this is basically a kid version of Nightmare on Elm Street, and despite having no blood or actual deaths, they still manage to capture the crap your pants feel of that movie. Yeah, they try really hard to make the imagery of this episode feel like something out of an actual nightmare. Most of the colors are very bleak, low saturated, and give off a very unwelcoming vibe, and the monsters of this episode at times made the actual Elm Street movies look like child's play by comparison. No, not that kind of child's play. No joke, there were actual shivers down my spine at times. But the real shining point of this episode is how it showcases the bond Hilda's developed for David and Frida. Hilda may be a cocky smartass at times, but it's really awesome to see her go to such extreme lengths to help David overcome his fears, even to the point of allowing the Mara to give her nightmares in exchange for not haunting David anymore. And what is Hilda's greatest fear, pray tell? Well, after Hilda responds very similarly to the Warner sibling trio towards each of the Mara's attempts to scare her, making for some good laughs. Are you trying new things because your life's in a rut? Eating people won't fill that void. We learn that Hilda's biggest fear is never learning to adapt to city life and truly fit in with David and Frida. We don't ride wolves, we ride bikes. That's right, the street hasn't got a wolf lane, has it? <gasps> Hilda, can't you ride a bike? Even I can ride a bike. This makes Hilda not only all the more likable, demonstrating how much she thinks of her new best friends, but also all the more relatable. I think all of us can recall a time where we were miserable that we couldn't get that one thing right. Hell, as someone with autism, that's kind of the story of my life, but this episode also reminds us that with good friends and perseverance, you can find a way. Plus, and this is kind of a spoiler, so skip here if you wish to avoid it, it's pretty freaking awesome that David decides he'd rather forego this opportunity to have Mira free dreams forever and wake Hilda up because he can't stand seeing her in such an agonized state. Shows how much he and Frida both think of Hilda. And hey, if you manage to impress a Freddy Krueger like demon enough to back off you with your courage, that's saying something. This episode not only managed to scare us crapless with some delightfully twisted yet creative disturbing imagery, but also was a great showcase of the incredible bond these three friends had and helped make them even more relatable than they already were. Number 6 The Tide Mice You may have noticed that Hilda has many similarities to another of Bella Ramsey's roles, Mildred Hubble. Not only are they both tragic fish out of water in a society that they have about as much understanding of as Frank Gallagher does about being a good person, but they also have a tendency to often think before they act, usually with good intentions, but messy results nonetheless. And this episode was a perfect display of that. David and Joanne are both in a bad state. David, as you saw in the Eternal Warriors episode, is an amazing singer. Don't let your love fly away. Stop singing! What? Okay, we've used that clip enough, I agree. But the trouble is, every time he tries to display that talent, some insect happens to fly into his mouth and throws him off. Plus, Joanna's having trouble coming up with building designs that win over buyers and is having to work as a hardware store customer service rep just to make ends meet. Hilda naturally wants to help them out, and after stumbling upon the reference section of the library, she comes across a spell book that contains one spell designed to keep one's friends forever. Said spell involves summoning a supernatural mouse that turns the one that they have contact with into a prodigy at whatever skill they have, she does so for David and her mother, and it works like a charm. David's seeing like Frank Sinatra, and Joanna's designing buildings like Frank Gehry. The only thing is, since the book was for reference only, she had to make a photocopy of the page that had the instructions for the spell, but that's all she needed anyway. I mean, sure, the page did mention something about a footnote later in the book, but how important could a teensy footnote possibly be? A hell lot more than we give them credit for, since said footnote reveals that keep your friends forever means to take possession of their souls in this case, which will happen in 30 days if the reverse enchantment isn't performed. And lo and behold, it's the 30th day and drawing very close to dark. So what's so phenomenal about this episode? Well, for starters, we get a really nice display of David's singing talent here. Bounce, bounce 
But more importantly, this was definitely one of the more dramatic episodes of the show. I mean, there is a little comedy here and there, but come on, the premise is basically someone unknowingly draining the souls of the ones they love the most. Imagine how it would feel if you realized you were doing that instead of making their life's heaven on Earth like you thought. Then again, it might have been kind of funny to see Hilda, Joanna, and David all share a body together- No, 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 what the hell am I saying? That's just freaking demented. Plus, the look of the possession with pupilless eyes and excruciating pain looks eerily similar to the possession scenes in The Exorcist and The Evil Dead, two of the scariest movies ever made. And we have quite a few of those shots in this episode. But again, that really contributes to the tension and drama of this episode, and it's all topped off with a James Bond-like driving scene, a visually dazzling exorcism, and this heartwarming exchange. Hilda, I know you meant well, but what were you thinking? I thought I'd found a way to give you guys a lucky break, that's all. <sighs> well, that's... that is very sweet. This episode demonstrates the importance of having all the facts before carrying something out with some of the most dramatic and scary as hell execution in the whole series, and a premise good enough for the latest American Horror Story season Red Tide to shamelessly rip off, right down to the title. Only while their attempt was considered average at best, this episode's attempt at showing supernatural talent boosting with monstrous results succeeded with flying colors. Number 5 the Stone Forest. This is that stellar season 2 finale that I mentioned earlier. It's great for many reasons, but I think the best one of all is that this is the episode that fully patches things up between Hilda and Joanna. What do I mean? Well, in this season, the two don't have a falling out per se, but they somewhat drift apart emotionally. Hell, just compare the intros in both seasons. Hilda's reached that phase we all do where we start putting our social lives before our family lives, to the point where she happily starts lying to Joanna just to get out of spending time with her and instead go on adventures with David and Frida. I can't say whether we've all started regularly lying to our own parents, but come on. We've all been through that phase where we're wanting to be our own people and establish distance from our parents. That's another big part of what makes Hilda so relatable. But Joanna's naturally pissed when she discovers Hilda's lies, and while they do technically make up, there is still a bit of a rift between these two emotionally. That is up to this episode. So what's the scoop? Hilda's been helping Freed all day with her witch homework from Cackle's Academy. No, just kidding! From this witch named Tildy who's tutoring her that I'll talk about a little later. She wants to go back and help some more after dinner and even spend the night, but Joanna has other plans, namely for some long overdue mother-daughter bonding time via a board game. Hilda is not pleased with this change of plans and after some belittling comments towards her mom gets sent to her room. She tries to use her house spirit Tantu, who can teleport people to get to Frida's, but Joanna catches her and the interference transports them to this cave in God knows where. The two set off to try and find their way home, not on the best terms with each other, but find that these caves just happen to be where all the trolls reside, including this mother troll who doesn't seem too fond of the pair, even if her baby is. And through a lot of trials and tribulations, the two ultimately remember why they used to have such a great bond in the first season. And what's really great is, their reconciling just feels so natural. They start off the adventure acting like the predicament was entirely the other's fault, but we see these two slowly but surely grow emotionally closer while navigating this troll-infested labyrinth. I'm sorry. I'm sorry too. I broke my promise. It was just... It was so hard being out there and not knowing what was going on. Just waiting and worrying. It felt awful. Hilda, it's okay. It's okay. Plus, this is the first episode in a long time where Joanna has a leading role, and she shows that she can be just as badass as her daughter if someone she loves is in danger. And believe me, there is a lot of that in this episode, which makes for some awesome Indiana Jones-style excitement that'll keep you engaged from start to finish. And it's all topped off by earning the approval of the mean mother troll and this exchange that seals Hilda and Joanna's bond once again. You really don't wish I was different. I wish I knew what in the world you were thinking sometimes, and I'll admit that being your mum has some unique ups and downs, but I wouldn't swap it for anything. The episode wisely downplays David and Frida's roles in favor of giving Joanna a long overdue spotlight, but does still fit in a few nice bits for them as well. But this episode on the whole is mainly about Johanna and Hilda, how they finally make peace in a super exciting badass adventure and finale to a spectacular second season. 
Only thing is, that mother troll seemed to grow a little too fond of Hilda, but that's for a bit later down the list. Number 4 The Deer Fox Definitely one of the more emotional episodes and a spotlight episode for, as you probably guessed based on the title, Hilda's Deer Fox Twig. The plot is basically a condensed version of the Peanuts film Snoopy Come Home, in which Hilda and Joanna have been severely neglecting Twig lately, and as a result, Twig feels that life in Trollberg is keeping him from his true calling and decides to return to the forest. Hilda is naturally quite upset that Twig's gone, and after she and her mother's search and Trollberg is in vain, the two realize that he must have gone back to the forest. They head out there and in the process recall how Hilda first came across the little deer fox, and winning him back may be a little hard seeing how he plans to go back to his old family. I'll detail this a bit later. So yeah, like said before, this episode is pretty much Snoopy Come Home reimagined as an episode of Hilda. Well, save for... Point is, that's the most beloved theatrical Peanuts movie out there. Except maybe for... well, the Peanuts movie. Okay, we're getting off track. Bottom line, great movie to pay homage to. But moving on, it's pretty neat to see how Hilda and Twig first met, and it was a pretty awesome first meet at that. Apparently when Hilda was about six, she got the little deer fox unstuck from a cave, and to return the favor, Twig saved Hilda from falling off a cliff. And what's more, it turns out that deer foxes are creatures that only return to Earth every few years, and Twig actually gave up the opportunity to return to his dimension when he found out Hilda was in trouble. Really shows gratitude, doesn't it? Another impressive thing is, even though young Hilda is clearly Bella Ramsey's voice digitally higher pitched, it also just feels so natural. Like this probably is what Bella Ramsey sounded like when she was six years old. Oh, beautiful! Look at these horns! They're like little twigs! Kudos to the editors. Anyway, they ingeniously show us this memory recall in pieces as Hilda slowly realizes how important Twig is to her and why she shouldn't have taken him for granted. And we find out that Twig was actually returning to the forest since the migration back to his universe was happening at that time, and he'd be reunited with his parents for the first time in years. But is still happy to save Hilda's life yet again when a wolf threatens her by the cliff he saved her at before. And it's a pretty badass scene. Anyhow, when Hilda finds out what Twig is up to, she understands that Twig wants to go back to his family, but not without this scene. Our house is gone, the mountain's gone, our life here is gone, and now... Now Twig's gone too. <laughs> Neat fact, Bella Ramsey really did cry when recording this scene. Really shows how awesome she is at getting into character. The kid's a pro! But of course Twig comes back because... No deer foxes allowed. Oh wait, no, I got the ending confused with Snoopy Come Home because of all the similarities to that film. No, Twig realizes that the spirit calling out to him to return home at the beginning was actually a representation of Hilda herself. His parents non-verbally confirm that his home is with Hilda, the two have a really heartfelt reunion, and Hilda promises not to take Twig for granted any longer. Plus, she finds that her crazy adventures are a lot more fruitful when Twig is involved. Some other highs for this episode are giving Johanna a prominent if not starring role, and also giving Woodman a cameo. But this episode is primarily about the importance of not taking those you love for granted, because you may not know how much they mean to you until they're gone. And more importantly, showing that Hilda and Twig do indeed have... Number 3 Hilda and the Mountain King Yeah, I know, how could this possibly not be number 1? Or even number 2? Again, these are just my silly personal opinions, but I don't think this movie is 100% flawless. But that's not to say it's not really damn good, either. Picking up where the Stone Forest left off, namely where we find the baby troll Baba back in Hilda's room as a human and Hilda back in the Stone Forest as a troll, Hilda tries to flee back to Trollsburg, but gets petrified once she enters the sunlight as all trolls in this world do. Anyway, Johanna quickly puts two and two together and starts searching for her trollified daughter. 
but the fact that the Trollberg Police, or Safety Patrol as they go by, is going all out to eradicate the threat of trolls from an outside the trollproof wall curfew, to extra bells on the trolls, to a gun that petrifies trolls even at night, to even anti-troll propaganda, ooh, is complicating things a bit. Meanwhile, after being unpetrified, Hilda strikes a bargain with this especially big troll called Trundle. She does him a few small favors, and he'll restore her humanity. While doing so, Hilda finds that Trila, the troll who kidnapped her and swapped her species with her baby, is actually very nice. She explains that she did so because she wanted a safer life for her baby, free from troll persecution, and she figured Hilda would want a more deviant, adventurous lifestyle. Trila teaches Hilda all the perks of being a troll, as well as a little history lesson about this troll who called himself the Mountain King that was organizing an invasion of the city, but the other trolls had a change of heart and overthrew him with some undisclosed method. Gee, I wonder what could have happened to him. So what's so awesome about this film? First off, it's easily the most visually marvelous Hilda installment ever. Most of the shots are at such a grand and massive scale, and the layouts we see are phenomenal. The colors, the shading, even the more mundane locations like the field still have an upgrade to them. Hell, some parts could even rival the best scenes from the Disney Renaissance in animation quality. Not only that, but the expressions of the characters are so damn layered, which perfectly captures the phenomenal performances all the actors give. Not that the actors weren't amazing already, but this is easily their magnum opus. Daisy Haggard perfectly captures the fear a parent has when their child is missing and potentially endangered. Oliver Nelson and Amira Falls on Ojo also convey similar concern one would have for their best friend in this situation. Bella Ramsey nails the fear a child has at being kidnapped, as well as the confusion and stress one would probably have at adjusting to the body of a troll. Speaking of grief and drama, Alpha's pet pigeon actually gets eaten and doesn't come back in this movie, making for the show's first permanent death. So yeah, this movie sounds amazing, so what keeps it from being number one? Well, my issue is that the writing is a little bit hasty in some components. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guessed this already, but this is still a major spoiler, so skip here to avoid it. Yeah, big shock, the Mountain King's actually Trundle, and all those favors he had Hilda do for him were to free him from the prison the other troll set for him. And I'm sorry, but I just don't think he's very interesting. Remember me mentioning his backstory earlier? That wasn't a paraphrasal, that's literally the whole story. There's so little time given to his motivations, or even giving him an interesting personality for that matter. He's not that funny, he's not that intimidating, he doesn't even look all that interesting. The only cool thing I could find with him is that he kind of sounds like James Earl Jones. Another thing that kind of bothered me was, David and Frida want to help Johanna find Hilda, and she acts like she's going to let them, but then... This is my house! I'm so grateful that you want to help, I really am. You are the best friends Hilda could have, but it's not right to drag you kids into this. I'm sorry! Look, I get the real reason for this was because the plot required them to be in the bell towers in the finale, which they couldn't have been if they had gone with Johanna, but the way she rejects them just feels so forced. Johanna knows David and Frieda are just as skilled and competent as her daughter, so this refusal just feels like she's completely disrespecting them. I feel there should have been a bit more to this refusal, like, I know you guys are more than capable of helping, but you're like my second children, and if anything happened to you, my life would have a major gap. You know, kind of like Mr. Incredible and his family, or Hopper and Eleven in the Stranger Things Season 3 finale. But as is, she just kind of seems like she's talking down to them like they're defenseless little kids. But again, these rush plot points are only few in an otherwise dramatic, beautiful, and captivating story, complete with a frickin' awesome final showdown, and a happy ending that I won't dare spoil for you, but let's just say, I never thought I'd see it on this show. Next one. Number 2. The 50-Year Night. Probably Hilda's most well-intentioned yet disastrous escapade in the whole series, the episode starts with Hilda still grounded for lying to Johanna like I mentioned earlier, and naturally is pissed as hell. Her poker game with Twig is interrupted when she notices her elderly neighbor Mr. Austenfeld vanish and then instantly reappear before her very eyes. She looks around the apartment to investigate. Don't worry, she's not leaving the building since she's still grounded and her findings lead to an old magazine called Trollberg Digest that transports her and Alpha back in time 50 years. Hilda goes out to look around. But not on the day I'm grounded. Ah, oh, that's a 
fair point. Ah, you're good with loopholes. Indeed. Anyhow, Hilda finds Mr. Austenfeld, actually many versions of him, going into this nightclub to admire this handsome young man, take three guesses who he is, meeting this pretty young lady and bonding with her, but ultimately parts ways. Hilda returns to the present to learn from Mr. Austenfeld that, big shock, it's the past version of himself, and someone enchanted the magazine he was reading that night to transport the one who opens it back to the very night he met her. And it's Tildy, that witch tutoring Frida that I mentioned earlier. So he set a subscription to order copies of that magazine so he can continuously admire that wonderful night. Hence why there were multiple versions of himself in the past, previous trips that he had made. Hilda figures the two are meant to be, so she goes back, plays Cupid, and hooks the two up. Job well done! Uh, where did that big giant worm come from? I'll tell you in a minute, but let's talk about this episode. Yes, this premise is simple, and there's a pretty good chance it's been done somewhere in media before, but the episode just does it so damn well. The few seconds we see these two in the bar are just so sweet and heartfelt, and you could easily see why Mr. Ostenfeld got a magazine subscription if it meant continuously returning to this night. We also see a montage of these two in the alternate timeline where he hooked up with her, and sure, it's no Carl and Ellie from Up montage, but it's still very moving. But is it really worth it since Mr. Ostenfeld never actually experienced any of these wonderful moments? Well, it's definitely not on account of that worm thing, namely a time worm that's out to devour everyone from the previous timeline where Mr. Ostenfeld and Tildy never met. That's really original. Instead of just vanishing from existence like in most time travel media, a giant worm comes along and frickin' eats everyone. And we actually see this worm eat Hilda's past version from the previous trip on screen, as well as her Doctor Who-like future self here to set things right. But wait, wouldn't eating the past Hilda have caused the present one to disappear and... Eh, yeah, it's Hilda. Logic's not what this show's known for. Besides, seeing Hilda actually get eaten on screen is pretty bizarrely intense. And I thought David getting his head chopped off was creepy. And the scene where Hilda's evading the worm could give Quentin Tarantino a run for his money. And how they set things right, I won't dare spoil for you. I know I gave some spoilers for Hilda and the Mountain King, albeit with warnings, but I do not have the heart to do it for this one. All I can say is, you should probably have a box of tissues by your side for tears of joy and tears of grief. But I can say that this episode also does this for Johanna a bit. When Hilda returns to the present on the run from the Time Worm, we see Johanna in her car showing very realistic pain of having to ground her daughter for the first time ever. Am I doing the right thing? This isn't the sort of mum I wanted to be, but what am I supposed to do? I... <laughs> Oh, Joanna, just get a grip. I don't have kids myself. Hell, I'm not even married. But if I ever do, that's probably how I'm going to react the first time I have to ground them. Plus, some heart that I can give away is that Johan and Hilda do apologize to one another at the very end. And while their relationship isn't fully patched, again, that doesn't happen until the Stone Forest episode, the apology is very sweet, and Hilda's even ungrounded in the next episode. And again, I really wish I could talk about the ending, because it's a big part of why this episode is so high up on the list. But my conscience just won't let me, and once you see it yourself, you'll understand. But either way, this episode is a very nice mix of sweet romance, Tarantino-style action, creative time travel concepts, and the most bittersweet ending in media I've seen after Spider-Man No Way Home. And the number one episode of Hilda is... The Beast of Cauldron Island. There's certainly a lot of memorable moments in Hilda, but I'd say the best known scene in the series is where Johanna chews Hilda out for her constant lying in the second season and grounds her for the first time ever. And that happens in this particular episode. But is that enough for me to rank this as number one? Well... It's a bit complicated. Some unidentified sea monsters attacking the harbors, which Alberg, this egotistical cop I haven't really talked much about, deduces to be the Lindworm and organizes an attack. Hilda knows that's not the case because the Lindworm is a vegetarian and organizes a rescue party with her friends. Only thing is, Johanna has a picnic planned for them that day, so Hilda lies and says her Sparrow Scout tribe has a beach cleanup activity. So they go off, save the day. I'll go into detail with this a bit later. Hilda comes back for dinner that night, and Johanna asks how her beach cleaning went. Hilda maintains the lie and says it went great. But then... I told myself, if she comes in here and she just tells the truth... Mom? I called Raven Leader, 
There was no scout activity today. Yup, Hilda flunked Johanna's morality test. So a big reason why I love this episode so much is, besides giving us a very powerful scene that I'll detail later, it shows how the writers of Hilda are some of the most intelligent TV writers in all of media. What do I mean? Well, as we know, Johanna has no problem with the dangerous adventures Hilda goes on. Well, okay, she isn't thrilled about them, but she's never once in the entire series not let her go on an adventure for being too dangerous. Johanna knows what her daughter is capable of, and that's why she's so likable. The message of this episode was to teach kids that it's wrong to lie to your parents, and it's gonna catch up to you eventually if you continuously do it. And the episode strongly clarifies its moral with tiny details like having Hilda lie to Johanna simply get out of spending time with her rather than for being too dangerous, and also having the adventure itself be pretty dull compared to the other episodes. The action scenes are few, the humor is average at best, and on top of that, the Lindworm shows he's more than capable of warding off Albrecht's attacks all by himself. And you know, all that works perfectly here. Most other writers would probably have had this adventure be really exciting and have the Lindworm really need Hilda in order to survive the safety patrol. But if that were the case here, the more we would have felt Hilda was in the right to lie to her mother. But by making the adventure more mediocre, the less we feel the situation demanded such immediate attention, and thus we less side with Hilda's lying to get out of the family picnic. That's a really ingenious way to subliminally generate audience emotions. Great example of less is more. All this makes it feel like the adventure could have easily waited until the next day and Hilda should have gone to the picnic that day with her mom. Anyway, let's talk about the big fight scene that's arguably the most famous scene in the entire series. Usually voice actors record their lines separately and Hilda is mostly no exception. But according to TV Tropes, the director had Bella Ramsey and Daisy Haggard record this scene together to get the exceptionally strong performances needed for this scene. I know TV Tropes isn't the most credible source, but it wouldn't surprise me one bit if this is true, because it really feels like Bella and Daisy are naturally working off one another's deliveries. Okay, but- But nothing. If you could let me explain- That you lied to me and then disappeared while there's a sea monster attacking the harbor? I was worried sick! Mum, you don't understand. I had to- You don't have to do anything. You are grounded. What? And you're not leaving this house without me until I say so. And there's so many awesome tiny details like having the comical Tonsu exit before the fight kicks off to strengthen the drama, this brilliantly torn expression of Johanna about whether or not she's doing the right thing, and even having the more sweet but melancholy My Name is Hilda song by Bella Ramsey play during the credits instead of the usual theme really fits the tone of the moment. And if you're wondering whether I think Hilda should have been grounded, yes I do. Because again, the issue was not her adventures, but rather her starting to lose respect and connection with her mother, to the point of her lying to her like it's no big deal at all. Being punished sucks, but our parents did it to us to help us learn. And again, Hilda and Johanna aren't thick as thieves after she's ungrounded, but she does stop lying to her mother after this. In any case, being grounded for the first time was a very big moment in the series, and the writers really went out of their way to strengthen the drama as well as clarify the message of this crucial scene, resulting in some of the most intelligent writing in all of television. And that's why I think this episode is the best one of all. And those were my top 10 favorite episodes of Hilda. Here are the runner-ups in case you're disappointed that your favorite episode wasn't on my list. But anyway, what's next for me, you might wonder. Well, what I have next is an old versus new of a classic musical involving Shakespearean romance reworked as a 50s street gang setting. Speaking of music, one more time. Don't let your love fly away, fly away. Don't be afraid to seize the day.